correct, uh, currently working within the Development Economic Social Issues Branch at OHCHR. In her current role, she is the coordinator of partnerships, engagement, and outreach for social justice. She has worked over 20 years with the UN Human Rights Office. She has worked in Afghanistan, Nepal, Tanzania, Iraq, and in the Pacific. Um, Masiaka has worked for several years on a range of human rights issues, which include street children, countering torture, business and human rights, countering discrimination, climate change, supporting youth to engage with and on human rights issues, strengthening national institutions' ability to work with human rights, including police, military, armed forces, judiciary, and establishing national human rights commissions, working with civil society and non-governmental organizations. Uh, the holder of a PhD in international human rights law and international humanitarian law, masters in international human rights law, bachelor's in genetics, and also studied for an advanced diploma in computer science. Uh, that is quite the introduction, like we already said. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Chitra Masiaka, she wants us to play the video right now. Uh, give me a few minutes. Sure, no issues. Okay. So uh, it's good afternoon for everybody out there and good morning for me. So a very uh, good day to everybody. Thank you very much for uh, letting me join this event. I have to say that I didn't know about it, but I really enjoyed reading up and, and listening to everybody uh, today. And uh, your, um, I, I have to say that I'm very impressed with the previous session that I just saw. I think everybody was uh, amazing, very, very confident and very tech savvy and very knowledgeable. And that was very impressive. I also liked all your pledges and the actions you had taken. And um, as I introduce myself, I have to say that today, I hope we can have a conversation. I don't really have a prepared presentation for you, but I hope that I will be able to share one or two of my stories, my experiences of learning about climate change and, and understanding better how we could do things and perhaps link it with some of the presentations that, uh, that you made. So um, I would like to begin by sharing uh, a poem done by a very young activist and poet um, named Kathy Gentle Killer. She's from the Marshall Islands. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her and working with her. And I think that if there's one thing that gives you, gives all of us this message about climate change, it's some of her work. And I want to start with a short poem by her. So if you could please play the video now. Here's a second, I'll come and playing the video. Okay. And, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to have an interactive dialogue. Because the kids are very energetic and enthusiastic here. Uh, they will go ahead and put their thoughts and comments in the chat section. Sure. And I hope I'll be able to answer them. Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from atolls, sunken volcanoes, undersea descent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. I'm coming to you from the land my ancestors chose, Ailangainan, Marshall Islands, a country more sea than land. I welcome you to Kadashiknunan, Greenland, the biggest island on earth. With me I bring these shells that I picked from the shores of Beginni Atoll and Runit Dome. In my hand I hold these rocks picked from the shores of Nuuk, the foundation of the land I call my home. shells I bring with me a story of long ago, 
two sisters frozen in time on the island of Wuyai. One magically turned to stone, the other who chose that life to be rooted by her sister's side. To this day, the two sisters can be seen by the edge of the reef, a lesson in permanence. With these rocks I bring a story told countless times, a story about Sisuma Amla, mother of the sea, who lives in a cave at the bottom of the ocean. This is a story about the guardian of the sea. She sees the greed in our hearts, the disrespect in our eyes. Every whale, every stream, every iceberg are her children. When we disrespect them, she gives us what we deserve, a lesson in respect. Do we deserve the melting ice, the hungry polar bears coming to our islands, or the colossal icebergs hitting these waters with rage? From one island to another, I ask for solutions. From one island to another, I ask for your problems. Let me show you the tide, coming for us faster than we'd like to admit. Let me show you airports underwater, bulldozed reefs, blasted sands, and plans to build new atolls, forcing land from an ancient rising sea, forcing us to imagine turning ourselves to stone. Can you see a glacier's grown the weight of the world's heat? I wait for you, here on the land of my ancestors. Heart heavy with a continuous thirst for solutions. As I watch this land change while the world remains silent. Sister of ice and snow, I come to you now in grief. Mourning landscapes that are always forced to change. First through wars inflicted on us. Then through nuclear waste dumped in our waters. On our ice. And now... This. Sister of ocean and sand, I offer you these rocks, the foundation of my home. May the same unshakable foundation connect us, make us stronger than these colonizing monsters that still to this day devour our lives. The very same beasts that now decide who should live, who should die. Sister of ice and snow, I offer you these shells and the story of the two sisters as testament, as declaration, that despite what we are told, we will not leave, we will choose stone, we will choose to be rooted to this reef forever. From these islands, we ask for solutions. From these islands, we ask, we demand, that the world see beyond ACs, SUVs, their pre-packaged convenience, their oil slick dreams, beyond the belief that tomorrow will never happen, that this is merely an inconvenient truth. Let me bring my home to yours. Let's watch as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Amsterdam, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Osaka try to breathe underwater. You think you have decades before your home fall beneath tides? We have years, we have months before you sacrifice us again, before you watch from your TV screens and computer screens to see if we will still be breathing while you Sister, I offer you these rocks as a reminder that our lives matter more than their power. That life in all form demands the same respect we all give to money. That these issues will affect each and every one of us. None of us is immune. And that each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. Thank you for that. Now, um, I want to share with you my own discovery of engaging with climate change. So I moved to the Pacific in 2016. And one of the first things that I realized when I landed in Fiji was that it was amazingly beautiful. The sea was just unbelievable. And then you discovered 
that you couldn't find accommodation even in the main capital city very easily. And you, I started asking why, and then I kept hearing about the word Winston. It's all about Winston. Winston was a category five storm that had hit Suva, uh, that had hit Fiji about almost 12 months ago. And the entire country was still struggling with it. It had been so powerful that it had wiped out entire segments of villages. That was my first experience. And then I started hearing people talk about how scary it was, uh, how they had not been able to come out of the cellars of their houses. Note that this is people who actually had cellars to go to or who had a basement that they could go into that they had survived for days with candles and um, being bunkered down, hunkered down to protect themselves from the elements. And at the same time, I heard the story of 12 transgendered people who were, who had chosen to stay in a small wooden house and face the elements. And so the question, why is it when this was such a life-threatening calamity, did people not go into the evacuation center or into the safe homes, into these areas which had been designated as safe spaces? So here you have a life-threatening situation and at the same time you realize even in these moments, we human beings tend to discriminate against each other. We see somebody else as different from us. So these were two parallels that I came to learn immediately. That the people who had bunkered down were so afraid of how the others would react to their presence that they chose to stay out in a category five storm, cyclone. I don't know how many of you would have ever experienced something like that. But I know in certain parts of the country, there has been a tsunami. There have been some extreme weather conditions. And so you may, some of you may be aware of it. Some of you may know somebody who was caught up in some of these experiences. Believe me, it's one of the most frightening experiences one can have. Next, I will take you to the small island of Tuvalu. It was the most amazing water that I had seen, the color of the water, the beauty of the land. I landed there in the morning, but at five o'clock in the afternoon, I saw something very unusual. Funafati, the capital, is a small elongated strip. When you get a chance, Google it and you will be able to see it. And at five o'clock in the evening, what is a king tide came in, and the capital was divided into two parts because the waters are rising and the land is sinking. And it's something that is quite stunning because all of a sudden you realize that people living on the same, in the same city are completely disconnected from each other. Then we went on a visit to another island. And I was looking at a big, beautiful map on the wall of the boat. And, I, and this was a research boat. And I said, oh, it shows this beautiful island. Are we going to it? And the captain looked at me and said, no, I'm afraid not. That particular island that you're pointing at went underwater quite a long time ago. And you think, oh, already? Because we've been thinking so much that climate change is something that is going to happen sometime in the future. But in the Pacific was my first realization that how late it already was for so many people. I have a few photographs that I want to show you of a village that I visited, which is one of the first villages in the world that was relocated due to climate change. Um, I'm not sure uh, how it's going to work. I'm going to try. Uh, and just share my screen uh, with you uh, and hope that it works. OK, 
Can I do a share screen directly on yes, Zoom? Yes, you have access. You can go ahead and share screen. Okay. Okay, let, let me know if you can see it. Can you see it? Can you see the presentation account? Okay, great. So this is one of the first villages I visited. And I wanted just you to just look at the picture because this is the story we are seeing repeated village after village now. So these are the coconut trees that have completely died out and are falling down due to the incursion of seawater into the land. These are entire villages and what is left of a village after the water came in. Uh, this is the headband of a village, the same village I'm talking about. Of, It's a small island called Savu Savu in Fiji. And he was pointing out to what used to be his house, which no longer you can see. It's actually gone under. He, under the water, you could see some parts of his house still. I want to also show you this. This is a picture on the left where you see a man sitting on a gravestone with the house behind him. It's the same graves on the other side. The entire graveyard has gone under the water. Now here I just wanted to talk to you because I want to come back to you on types of losses that you experience. So what is interesting is this, that very often we talk about climate change and we see it as rising temperatures, we see it as uh, destruction of our ecosystems. But I also wanted to share with you that when I was in this village, we heard stories of how children and grown-ups had been affected their emotional mental well-being had been affected how that loss of culture that connection with their cultural identity the family history was also such a big loss this village was the first displaced village that was relocated globally it was the first time something like this took place and as the office of human rights we were engaging with them and we were trying to understand how they could be helped with. So this is, um, this young lady sitting here is from Delhi and she was an intern who's a psychologist who was working with us. And she was meeting with children in a village to understand some of the emotional challenges that they had faced, not just because of the fact that they were all of a sudden uprooted, this was very big, but what were some of the other challenges they faced, how they were feeling, what was the emotional impact. And the loss of cultural identity and the link which their families and the histories was, came across equally strongly. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to come back to talking a little bit about human rights. Why am I talking about human rights now and using this phrase here? The first time I went to participate um, in COP23, I had a very interesting encounter when somebody from the audience asked me, what are you doing here? You work in human rights. This is a conference about climate change. And it was a shock to me. Why are people asking me this question? How can you not see the connection? And so we had an interesting discussion. And my next response to them was, well, let's talk about something very fundamental to us, your right to life. Is that a right that is at risk because of climate change? Yes. Is your right to safe drinking water at stake here? Yes. Are we seeing different groups being treated differently? Yes. And so then the question from me was, isn't this all human rights? So today I just want to take a few minutes and talk to you a little bit about human rights and a little bit in the same context, because I just want to say that 
It's very important to remember that human rights are for all people equally. Every single human being, irrespective of the color of their skin, the language they speak, the religion they believe in, all rights are equally important and should be made available for everybody. And this concept that all human rights are universal, interdependent, indivisible and interconnected is very important for us to remember. Now, I just want you to think about the day today that you've had. When you woke up in the morning, did you brush your teeth? Were you in a safe location? You were at home with a roof over your head, perhaps in your room, sharing it with a brother or sister or in a separate room of your own. You went to the bathroom in your house. Um, perhaps it was a shared bathroom, perhaps it was a communal bathroom, but you had access to a bathroom, you had access to water. Mm. Now, very often when we think of human rights, we tend to think of human rights as something maybe sometimes we see in films. The police is beating up somebody or somebody has been tortured. But I want to bring you back to this point that in the morning when you woke up where you were in a warm bed, you got up, you turned on, you got electricity. You got up and you went to the bathroom, you turned on the tap, you had clean water. You were able to change into clothes and have breakfast. These are all human rights. These are all fundamental human rights. And they are as equally important as your right to participation, your right to have an opinion, to have freedom of expression to speak. Now, some of these may be difficult to understand at uh, this time, but I hope that we can talk about it. And maybe, maybe I will be able to help you understand it better. Maybe you already know it and you think, oh my God, what is she doing wasting our time? making things so basic and simple. I hope then you will be able, will be able to talk about other things maybe. Maybe your teachers can, you can have this discussion, but I want to also share with you that we have what we call the International Bill of Human Rights. This is made up of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is why we celebrate on 10th December every year what we call Human Rights Day. That is the birthday of this document. This is a document that more than 75 years ago, we said, this is the vision of what we want our world to be. And after almost eight decades, we are still struggling to make this a reality for everybody. That tells us how challenging sometimes achieving human rights is. Okay, now the International Bill of Human Rights, it's not just the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's very important that you also know that there are two other documents. And I would very much like to encourage you to look at these two documents. One is called the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. And the other one is called the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Please remember, both of these conventions are on par. They are equally important. And these three documents together make up the International Bill of Human Rights. And when I say human rights, please remember that they are universal, which means that they are for everybody in the world. Even within the country, they are for everybody in the country, whether they are in the north, in the south, east, west, whether they are rich or poor, they are for everybody. Now, when you look at these things and something that you may already, since you have been studying about COP and you've also been studying and understanding about the United Nations, because you have learned a lot. And I'm very impressed by your in-depth knowledge on so many difficult subjects that very often adults struggle with or refuse to accept that you are so open to learning and learning about this. Please remember that at the end of the day, our governments, when they meet up in what we call the General Assembly, they all vote for these conventions and laws. 
And then a government voluntarily decides we want to be a party to this convention. So for example, India and about a hundred, more than 150 other states have signed up and ratified a number of these conventions. Some of them are the Convention on the Rights of the Child. That is the one which has the maximum number of parties. Uh, then you have CEDAW, which is the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And in the same way, you have the one on economic, social, cultural rights and civil and political rights. So what does economic, social, cultural rights talk about? Economic, social, cultural rights talks about your right to an adequate standard of living. What is an adequate standard of living? Is that means, do you have protection in the frame of a house that gives you security, that keeps you warm when the weather is hot, that allows you to be safe, that allows you to have food, uh, clothing to suit the environment, that gives you enough access to medical care, that would be part of your adequate standard of living. And we say that every human being must have a certain amount to be able, and what is that certain amount? That certain amount that allows you to uphold your dignity, human dignity. So if I wanted to summarize human rights for anybody, and I was given one word to give, summarize human rights, I would say dignity. And that is something important to remember that human rights is not only about legal conventions and holding somebody responsible. It is also in the way that you treat people who may have less than you. For example, we see bullying in schools. Or we see people saying, I have a BMW and you have to come on the school bus. From something as simple as that, from making that effort to say, we are all equal and I want to ensure that the world for tomorrow, the world that I will leave, you're all children, but remember that you're going to be the adults and the leaders for tomorrow and then you will be responsible for ensuring a better world for the new generation, your children and your grandchildren. Because we all don't own the earth, we all inherit it for the next generation. We look after it for the next generation. And so this is going to be your call and the same thing for human rights. And when we talk about human rights, the idea is that we treat everybody equally. There is one thing about equality, and there's another thing we have to also keep in mind, that certain people have been left behind. This is the mantra from the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. Now, you all know about the 2030 Agenda. How many goals are there in it? 17 goals, right. And you know some of them. They are about poverty. They are about gender equality. They are about leaving, ensuring zero food hunger, the zero hunger. They are about protecting life under the sea, on the land, sustainable cities. There's a whole range of them. And the last one is on partnerships. So the 17 SDGs all together have a comprehensive approach which is grounded in human rights. And the mantra, leave no one behind, comes from there because it is all about making sure that if we want the planet to be prosperous and we want people to be happy and people to have a life of dignity, we have to ensure that everybody is moving ahead together. Imagine if you're going on a picnic with your school friends. And one of you is unable to walk because you have asthma, not keep up with the group as they grow up. And then maybe there is one of you whose bottle broke and you don't have water to drink. But ahead of you, you have your friends. Maybe one of them has two bottles. And you call out to them and nobody waits for you. How does that make you feel? Bad, right? And you're not able to enjoy that picnic. 
but when you call out or when your friends who are ahead of you with the two bottles of water realize that you are falling behind and they stop and they say oh i've left my friend chitra behind i need to get shukla to come with me we have to get them together with us we can't leave them behind that's what makes it worthwhile that's what makes it more important and that's the whole concept of leaving no one behind it doesn't mean it's the responsibility of the person who has been left behind it is equally the responsibility of the person who is moving ahead who has more to make sure i am able to bring people with me so this is the concept of leaving no one behind but how does it work in principle it works in principle because governments have voluntarily signed up and human rights is a legal obligation in the same way governments all over the world have committed and pledged to achieve the 2030 goals now all of human rights and all of these sdgs which are grounded and are based on human rights principles are all working with that same objective that we as a population on this world on this globe not only survive but that we thrive so what would it mean on that now all of us have been going through the pandemic covid-19 pandemic what have we learned from the pandemic we learned that the world is not as equal as we thought it was we learned that we have a lot more work to do when we say the world is not equal let's just talk about something as simple as this some of us have been privileged to be able to have access to water and soap throughout to do some things as washing hands this was a very important thing to protect us from covid right but then we discovered in many parts of the country not just our country in many different countries we discovered there were large chunks of population that did not have that access and believe me it was not just in poor countries like in asia or in africa we even found that there were communities in countries like us that had challenges around water and sanitation and who were those people they were the people for example who were traditionally marginalized or left behind you had black african american communities who did not have that or you had very poor latin american communities that did not have that and in the same way it's easy to criticize other people we should we have we looked around ourselves and have we seen how did some of the people in dharavi slum in mumbai resolve this issue and then i have a very positive story to tell you because the people in dharavi got together and they had support from people and they came up with an amazing response to covid they are actually cited as one of the best practices globally in terms of responding to a challenge as covid-19 in the first few months they were able to reduce and hold back covid infections because they came together and they had support from some of the doctors some civil society and they were able to tackle the challenge of sanitation water and hygiene to ensure that people were protected from covid in the same way we saw many fantastic stories across india where young people came forward school children came forward to ensure that food was available to people that didn't have food or soap and water was available and there were many individual actions such as this that fall within respect for human rights respect for the sdgs but what is interesting is this we must always remember that human rights is a legal entitlement it's not a piece of charity that you do this is something that belongs to everybody equally now um i just want to stop here once and just see if there is any question about what i have spoken so far and i'm afraid um i would like to ask our wonderful compare to just let me know how much time i have so that i can sort of uh, organize myself a little bit more yes sir we do have uh, 15 minutes left 
and uh, we'll uh, go through the questions once you're done with the session. Okay, so just just stop me whenever you think it's the right time, yes, please, on. because I don't know uh, if I should look at the chat screen if there are any questions right now. So, I'll read out the questions for you. You can go ahead okay. and ask them over the time. Okay. So I wanted to talk about this, and then I want to come back to your presentation. You know, it was very interesting for me because a lot of the action and the pledges you took fall under different categories of action that the UN encourages under the various SDGs. And so as you were talking, I was just looking at some of these things. You know, a lot of you referred to the uh, recycle, the triple R. That's something that comes up under a lot of the SDGs. Then if you look at uh, the SDG on climate change, it talks about something as simple that you can do, for example, participate in a cleanup day. That's something you could organize in your neighborhoods very easily. Then there's something about washing your hands, reusing, uh, reusing uh, products like water bottles, not don't not to use water bottles that are throw away and disposable. To learn more about how electricity is used and consumed. What can you do at your level? One of the simplest things that I say, and I say this to my own daughter, what I say to my own daughter is that um, take a shorter shower, turn off the electricity as soon as you leave the room. These are part of things that we can do. How can we create more green spaces? We don't necessarily need a big garden. We sometimes can have a small veranda. We can have a small box. We can have uh, material that could be thrown away that you could use to, to plant um, green vegetables. Uh, there are projects going on now where people are using different kinds of methods to grow vegetables. You know. Uh, renewable sources, but also innovative methods where you can do a lot more of indoor gardening and have your own gardens. So basically the message is to be brave, to be curious, to stay informed, learn about climate change and think innovation. Uh, I've also been very, very, um, uh, very, very proud when a number of the innovations uh, from young children across Asia have come across and have shown uh, people all over the world uh, what can be done. So these have been very, very interesting uh, part of, uh, of, of, of learning and showcasing what can be done. Now, one of the things we have learned with climate change has been that how does it affect people? The first thing was this, that people lost that shelter. People had to be moved. People lost jobs. People couldn't access medical facilities. Um, schooling was impacted. These are just the general things we have seen happening in climate change. If you add into that situation the pandemic, or you add some other challenges of conflict, or you add another challenge of the fact that if you're living on a small island, you may have run out of space completely because your island is sinking. So then what do you do? Sometimes it may seem like a theoretical question, but for a number of countries in the world, it's a harsh reality. In fact, Marshall Islands, Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, they're all going under. They've had to consider being climate change refugees. And large numbers of them have migrated to other countries. With the prospect that they may never be able to come back. In fact, one of the Pacific Island countries has purchased 60 hectares. 600 hectares of land in another country in Fiji on an uninhabited island because they feel if they have nowhere to go, 
then at least they will move there, you know. But can you imagine that? You no longer have your own country. You want to hold on to your nationality, but you are living in a different country now. So how do the children and the next generation grow up? Do they grow up as Fijians? Do they grow up as Marshallese? What language will they speak? What will they do in terms of learning about their culture? That's a significant loss for a people, but also for all of us in the world. So something to think about. In addition, what do you do when you are displaced, devastated, you've lost everything? How do you ensure your children get education? We found in a large number of communities, children get affected very badly. We see bad things happening to children. We also see children are unable to get educated. And what is education? It's a basic fundamental building block of life. If you have the possibility to be educated, you have the possibility of finding a good job when you grow up. If you have a good job, you have the ability to have an adequate standard of living when you get married. You will be able to provide for your children and give them a better life in, in, in turn. But once that access to education is interrupted, it has significant effect on the rest of your life. So it is extremely important that we are able to do more to ensure that children have access to education. It's also very important to talk about and understand that there are certain groups and communities that we tend to ignore or marginalize. So for example, I think somebody just put, it just popped up on the screen about laborers not being respected. And we saw that. We rely on people to come and work in our houses. We have either somebody who comes to clean up or wash the clothes or or do the gardening for us, or clean the cars. It's very normal in India, we see that. How well do we treat them? How well do we ensure that we are able to give them, for example, paid day off when they are sick? Do we take care of their medical bills? Can we do that? Is that a possibility? Is that something you'd like to discuss with your parents or with your teachers? Please do. This, by the way, is also something that is considered a government responsibility. But many governments are unable to do it or are unwilling to do it. And this is part of the challenge of human rights. Now, how is all of, why do I keep going backwards and forwards between this? We have seen that when climate change has been impacting the lives of people, all of these things that we take for granted or we don't always consider get affected. And then there is the whole issue of discrimination. There may be a religious group that we don't like. We tend to be very suspicious of. We may not be helpful to them. We may not treat them well. Is that correct? Is that the way to go ahead? No, that is wrong. Everybody is a human being and is entitled to full respect and dignity. And very often we see people talking about us and them. So in our own behaviors, we need to make sure that we are respectful of a group, whether they are from the north, northeast, south, east or west, and equally, whether they are a Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Jew, Christian, Buddhist, this should not matter, you're human beings first. So are we treating everybody with the same respect? Are we making sure that in the time of these challenging situations, do they have access to these issues? Excuse me, Atta, I am really sorry to interrupt you, but we have five minutes left. Would you like to go ahead and answer a few questions? Sure. This is all right, perfect. Then I'll read out the questions for you. Um, okay, maybe you read out three, four, or five, and then I'll take them one at a time. Okay, all right. So I'll read the first one. Which is more important in combating climate change? A country with a small population but high per, uh, per capita consumption, or a country with a large population but low per capita consumption? 
um, I'll continue with the second one. Continue, please. Yes. Yes. Okay. The next question says, how can students contribute in creating a world when no one is left behind? Uh, the other one says, will there be any impact on the education of children because of all this? And uh, there's, there's one another question. What were your main takeaways about the people during your visits to the various islands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are the questions we have about. Okay, so let me begin by the fact that as, sorry, did I lose you? No, okay, yeah. No. Let me begin by first that I think I love your questions and I want to say absolutely outright that it's equally challenging, high consumption, low, pop, low population, low population and low consumption. Because what did we see that the biggest thing I learned was that somehow when you, the higher consumption are the ones who are contributing greatest to the problem. The ones with the lowest consumption have been the Pacific Islands or the Antarctic or Arctic. They are the ones with the minimum consumption and contribution to the climate change causes. And yet they are the ones who are suffering the most. Is it challenging? It's equally challenging for them. But yet at the same time, what we see is countries that are better resourced, that are richer, if I can use that word, who have more infrastructure, and less people are able to be more resilient to them because they have the ability of the resources. But on the other hand, as we have learned and seen, as more storms have uh, touched the US or the UK uh, and across Europe in the last couple of weeks, we've seen despite having all these resources, Countries are now beginning to struggle and they are unable to step back from the fact that climate change is affecting everybody. So that's one. Uh, how can you ensure that no one is left behind? I think it starts uh, with you where you start with the point of making sure that your individual behavior is respectful of everybody's rights, that you are able to equally respect differences and differences of opinion and beliefs, and that together you're working to ensure that we have a better world. How can you do that? There's a number of actions uh, that we talked about. And I would also like to introduce you to a book, uh, which is this one. And I, and I hope that you can find it. It's called 170 Actions to Reduce Inequalities in the World. It's all about the SDGs and individual actions that can be taken, especially by young people and young persons all over the world. And I, and I would really encourage you to look at that. And equally, there's another group of 170 actions that I want to show you, which is about combating climate change by young people all over the world. So I think there's a lot of actions you can do, but I would remember, I would really encourage you to be bold, to be innovative, uh, and I can see that you're already doing that. You had some great ideas, but really uh, also be catalysts for change. That's very important that we have an aware group of youngsters who are actually fighting for change. And when I say fighting, I don't mean violently, but take up that responsibility where necessary to make others aware, including adults, because we don't always know everything. And sometimes we are guilty of being very lazy and we just let things go. To be there, to be that catalyst for change and push for a better world and insist that you know our policies should be better. Or you should treat people differently. And that also makes a difference. Is education going to be affected? Yes, we've already seen it being affected all over the world. Uh, in times of the pandemic, we have also seen that there's a huge number of children that have been affected all over the world. And during the time of the pandemic, the digital divide has made things even harder. And there's a group of children globally that are being referred to now as the lost generation 
that may not be able to come back to school because of the situation of their families. So clearly there's a lot to be done to make education more accessible and available to all children in the world. Um, what were my main takeaways? My main takeaway was this, that despite all challenges, we are amazingly resilient. People always rise to the challenge. And people can do a lot more than they are doing. When I met the village um, of Wunindongoloa first, I, uh, we had this discussion of what did they find the hardest. And an old lady in her 80s broke down and said, I grew up, I was born in that house, I grew up, I lived my entire life there. I thought I would die there, but I can't even go back and see the place. My entire family was buried in a graveyard there that is now under the ocean. So I feel like I've lost everything. She's in a new house, she has water, sanitation, but she still misses that. That emotional connection <coughs> was very strong. But at the same time, it meant that the infrastructure was not necessarily available to people. So it made life very difficult. And so governments and governments like Fiji and in the island states are very, um, they're struggling for resources. It's a very challenging time for them to be able to do all this. So what it does is it creates a different category. You have category of people who are well off and are enjoying things and are doing much better. And then you have groups of people who are really getting left behind. And that I think between the resilience being the first takeaway, the realization that more people are being left behind more easily because of this was the second one. And the third one was that people everywhere in the world want the same things for their children. They want education, they want health, the ability to have a better life. And all of that is affected when you have this situation. Thank you so much for answering all those questions.